Hello. Good evening, everyone. We're so happy to have you all here again. Um, you know, the holidays have been a busy time, so thanks for all the hardcore food and agriculture folks out there. Um, before we dive into the panel, I like to get a sense of who's in the audience. So I'm curious, who here um, works in the food sector, food versus agriculture? Food? Okay. Who works in agriculture, specifically? It can be both. That's fine. I'm just curious. Um, who here uh, owns or has grown up on a farm? Okay. Good. So you know your audience a little bit better than, than when we started. Um, I'm going to kick off by just allowing each of our, our panelists to talk about um, what you're doing that's innovating or disrupting in the food and ag space. Sort of a basic explanation of each of your businesses. And Mark, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And excited to be here to share our story. So I'm one of the co-founders for a company called Aero Farms. We're an indoor vertical farming company. Our global headquarters are in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, we grow in converted warehouse spaces without sun or soil. So we're able to use technology in a new way of thinking about how we redefine agriculture. Uh, we are able to grow with LED lights, with something called aeroponics. That's the Aero and Aero Farms. It's a way of growing that uses 95% less water, so we think about one of our most precious resources. Fundamentally, though, it's about how we enable local production at scale, how we can bring the farm to communities, and really be able to offer a year-round supply that is safe, it's nutritious, and delicious. So that's the kind of things we're doing at Aero Farms. All right, so uh, Boutrace, it's software as a service, also sometimes calling it storytelling as a service. Uh, I really founded Food Trace because I wanted to solve a problem for my first company, uh, a chain of juice bars that we were just running into, lots of supply chain issues, safety issues, wanted to make sure that all of our customers also understood where all of our products were coming from. As you see in the market today, more and more people are interested in understanding the provenance, really um, where their food is growing, where it's coming from, whose hands are touching it, and also where it's going. Uh, many businesses need to have more data uh, at the click of a button that's seamless as well as affordable. Uh, and we wanted, we wanted to build a, a platform that gave small and medium businesses uh, a very reliable, visually focused software service that a lot of the big food and agriculture companies were using. Uh, and so I launched Food Trace in 2014. Uh, partnered with Google in 2015 to focus on a maps feature so that we can offer mapping and data visualization as a service to food businesses around the country. Uh, grew to over 13,000 food businesses using our software uh, freemium service and sold it earlier this year. Now work on a few different food ventures um, on the venture capital side as well as on the CPG snack side uh, and happy to be here. So uh, FarmLead uh, is basically an online grain marketplace. Uh, effectively, what we do is we help farmers market their crop. We focus on um, the broad acre crop, so the classic corn and soybean, but we also cover a lot of the specialty grains, edible beans. Uh, think of things like flax, hemp, um, any type of bean or pulse you can think of. Um, very simple process. Uh, what we do is we allow farmers to reach a broader base of potential buyers and we help the buyers that are looking for these various sets of crops, be they processors, exporters, um, people that are feeding other live cattle, etc., uh, find the grain that they're looking for. So uh, what we're effectively doing is we're removing a lot of the inefficiencies in sort of how grain is marketed uh, across North America. Um, but also uh, giving opportunities for both producers and end users to identify um, different crops than what they're used to producing uh, because they now have a market access or an opportunity to grow crops kind of outside of what they're usually used to selling in a local market. Thanks. So that's what we do. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I want to kind of ask an underpinning question here, which is it seems like there's been a big surge in investment in agritech in the last couple of years. So I looked up a figure. It said that uh, 2015, the, the agritech investment funding was about $4.6 billion, which is around 10 times that of 2012. Um, seems like it tapered off a little bit in 2016, perhaps. But all three of you have raised money. Um, you've sold a company, Rihanna. You're raising money right now, or you said you just closed on a round. I'm curious, what do you think is driving this increased investment uh, interest in agriculture and food? 
You know, I think generally people are interested in investing in um, enterprises and ventures that um, not only solve for the short term, but solve for the long term. Mm -hmm. As we focus on sustainability within the country and around the globe, uh, and understand really how big agri agribusiness, um, agriculture is, not only in the US where it's a $2.4 trillion market, but um, across the world where it's the number one uh, in terms of workforce um, mm -hmm. industry. I think uh, we're also starting to find a really exciting time where you have uh, delivery startups, you have um, food startups that are focused on innovation and biotechnology and we're just eating different and we're understanding the impact of food um, with our health, with our environment, um, and just with our overall experience and, and quality of life. So it's an exciting time and I think just because people understand more of like what's happening and what they could do with you know, a little bit of change and, and it's, it's exciting for scientists and entrepreneurs to come together and, and really work on these things and, um, and make some money at the same time, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to build on that. I think it's really, you know, what we see are the global macro issues that are becoming more acute. So we uh, recognize that we have increasing population. This idea by 2050, you know, our population is going to grow to 9.7 billion. And the idea that we need to double our food production. Uh, we look at things like fresh water, access to fresh water, agriculture. 70% of fresh water goes to agriculture. 70% of the pollution is coming from agriculture. Uh, we think about a third of our the arable land has been lost in the last 40 years. Uh, we think about issues around overuse of pesticides, overuse of fertilizer, creating dead zones. Uh, we think about worker welfare. So these are becoming more acute. And we also we talk about the backdrop of food safety. You know, there's a recall you know, every single day uh, that's hitting the headlines. And so these are very, very serious issues. And there's a recognition that you know, we need different solutions at the table. And you know, this is one of the reasons why we see investment to help kind of foster that. Mm -hmm. And you see different parts of the equation here. Yeah, maybe if I can add to that, <clears throat> speaking a little bit from our vantage, which is you know a bit more upstream in the supply chain when you think of food, uh, I think sort of agriculture is one of the sectors that hasn't seen quite the technology penetration that we're used to in, say, urban environments or sort of consumer-facing uh, sectors. And so that is now coming um, quick and fast into the broader uh, sort of uh, basic production uh, part of the value chain. So I think that's a key trend that is driving sudden interest and awareness and surfacing opportunities where uh, innovation can be applied. I think the other, I think sort of more bigger, bigger themes, I think one of the things that I like to think about is there's kind of big trends that are clashing together that apply very well in the agriculture space. Um, <clears throat> biotechnology combined with our ability to capture data and crunch data is opening up a much broader understanding of the interactions of biology um, and plants and things like that. So if you think, like the comparison I like to use is, you know, there was a big um, buzz around uh, gut microbiomes uh, in humans. You have that exact same phenomenon in plants and in fields. Um, now that we have sensors that allow us to capture this information, but also to crunch it and start to develop an understanding, we're getting a much better understanding of the complexity of a life form in a field and whatnot, um, and it's opening up a whole new way of thinking or developing technologies or applications. Um, so, you know, a bit more on the upstream side, but then it reflects itself in even, I think, Aero Farms, which is kind of that intersection of robotics, technology, you know, you could speak more about it, but it's these themes that I think are coming into fruition. Yeah, the tools are, are very much part of this equation. And so we've been at this since 2004, so this is not an overnight, you know, equation. And we'll be the first to say this is very complex. The idea of how do you manage biology, right? And then you take it indoors and you think about the environment, environmental factors. Uh, we've taken a little bit of a different approach than other companies in that we've brought all this expertise in-house. And so we have mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, industrial engineers, lighting engineers, so thinking holistically how we bring this together. And that's really important, both in terms of like how we think about our investment around capital uh, expenditure in terms of that cost, but more importantly around the OPEX. But really, at the end of the day, it's about how we take all this information and then see the interaction and see the symbiotic relationship and understand, again, how to optimize those plants for traits and characteristics that have really gone to the wayside. So instead of that field farmer that's looking at the genetics and thinking about it, is it water resistant? Is it mildew resistant? Can it withstand a very complex supply chain? We're focusing on things like flavor, you know, that have gone to the wayside. Uh, you look at nutrition as well, and this is a really important aspect of, again, how do we deliver a better value proposition? And then that safety. So this idea of, again, there's sensors, there's monitors, uh, everything, we're looking at thousands of data points. And now and you know, how do we take big data and transform it into smart data? 
Um, you know, mentioning the idea of partnering with key players like a Google, we've partnered with Dell Technologies as well in terms of, again, how to harness the Internet of Things and think about, again, how does it scale, how does it replicate, and whether it's a farm in Newark, whether it's in Dubai, you know, we have the means and ability to see real time what's happening with, with the plants. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, like, as you said, your talent coming in, these engineers, and, and I was a biologist coming out of college, and you, you think your two routes are to go into kind of academia or going into a large company to do R&D, things that take a very long time to solve issues that you're super passionate about. So I think as the talent shifts over to these great startups, the you know, you know, fundraising and the excitement, mm -hmm. and it's you know, things that people were solving for 10, 15 years ago are now showing up on TechCrunch and Fortune and New York Times. And mm -hmm. so the talent and the money is flowing into this space, and mm -hmm. it's, it's just a great time for, for both of them to solve these major issues. I want to link those two comments together. You said something about smart data versus big data. I want to ask you about what that means, but then to your point on capacity, um, someone recently mentioned that there, there's no real program in digital agriculture or in agricultural sort of information science, that that's maybe an area where there needs to be more degrees or capacity built. And I'm curious, in terms of the, the new careers and new capacities we need to build beyond sort of sort of the simple, um, you know, we need more engineers, we need more computer scientists, we need biologists. What do we need? What do we need in terms of capacity? Yeah, there are a few things. I mean, the traditional land you know, grant universities that have been very much focused on field agriculture have not been developing this next generation. So we've been working with those schools and with those deans around the curriculum and thinking about that next generation. And it's very much a, an issue when we think about the average age of a farmer here in the US, it's 58. So in terms of, again, how do we create more careers and more opportunities? Um, so for us, one of the key things that we look at is not only the technical skill set we just talked about, but really uh, things like we think about the whole spectrum of STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and math. But math is one of the most important aspects in terms of having the tools and to interpret it and how do we go again from big data to smart data. Uh, our horticulture meeting looks like a statistics meeting, right? So we have these data sets and we're looking at, again, performance, we're looking at the variables and we've actually developed what we call growing algorithms. So it's very much dialed in in terms of taking those inputs and understanding, again, environmental factors, the plant, and then how do we optimize and think about that growing time and think about characteristics, not only optimize taste, texture, nutrition, um, Things like yield, though, are really obviously in terms of how you really have a, the right sustainable business model. Uh, but those are really important skill sets to be able to bring that together and understand, again, what are the implications. And so uh, we've been fortunate in our journey that we have brought people. And part of that is the shared passion and purpose of, you know, again, how do we change this equation? How do we transform? Part of it is that there's not the playbook out there, so we're writing, you know, a new chapter here. And so that's what we've been really excited about bringing talent in. And you work more directly with farmers at Farmlead right. and also uh, buyers. Uh, how are farmers and buyers evolving? What kinds of skills are they picking up or need to pick up? Yeah, I think one, one of the, the key skills or themes that um, I like to think about is for a very long time, especially if you look over the last sort of 20 years, so 90s onwards, um, the driving paradigm has been uh, produce a lot at the lowest cost possible, but a lot of the focus has been on driving yield. Um, and that's been the case. We achieve, you know, outstanding yield levels um, in, in many environmental settings, but I think you're starting to see a shift where the focus becomes a bit more ROI and economics. Um, especially right now, we're kind of in a period, if you look at sort of broad acre crops, depressed prices. Um, so there's a kind of an education process where people aren't necessarily saying, because I have the best looking crop, that's necessarily the most profitable crop. And so a lot of the skill set that you see and that I think is going to be important is not just I know how to grow a crop very well, but I also understand maybe there's a trade-off between the best looking crop and an average looking crop, but from a profitability point of view, it looks way more interesting in that sense. It's sort of teaching these concepts and these financial metrics and sort of the true management piece of things becomes very important. So you see a professionalization of the management of farms. I think there's another key theme, which is <clears throat> the notion that you either are going to be, a, I think, a cutthroat commodity producer, very efficient, very good ROI, or you identify that you can connect directly with your end consumer. You can build a niche product. You can build a direct marketing concept, either through partnering with intermediates or you know, yourself developing a bit of a brand and a concept, you know, local food, all those things. And that means that you don't necessarily have to focus on being a very efficient producer. You can be a specialized, high quality, 
particular high value producer. And so I think teaching people the notion of this is what the end consumers are asking for, what can I do in my production environment to meet into that is also something that if you think of skill sets and what to think about going forward is a way to kind of make sure that you have a sustainable business model mm -hmm. uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think the great thing is that we're getting, we're giving so much more access to uh, farmers that would never have thought about uh, kind of consuming data and turning it into a stronger business model. Yeah. And uh, the day-to-day -day is so hard to manage, you know, operationally. And being able to build software and tools and, and plugins that allow for them to optimize their day mm -hmm. without wasting a lot of time or engaging in a clunky um, kind of a clunky platform has mm -hmm. been exciting for, for us to work on. So I want to ask you about the future of traceability. Um, I'm curious sure. what everyone here will say. But we were talking a little backstage about the challenges to getting to full traceability, the challenges of harmonizing. Um, talk, to us, talk to us about where we are right now and where you think we'll be in five years in terms of what we'll be able to know about the food we're eating. Yeah, I think um, it's been a long road of kind of barriers and traceability and, and open data sharing. For, for a while, that was a part of like how a food company won, how a how a uh, farmer was able to win the market, right? It was by holding this data kind of secure and not really sharing with who they're selling to, who they're buying from. And, um, but the market has demanded a shift in that. And so um, over the past few years, you see a lot more companies trying to solve for uh, either some of the more soft applications of uh, data, sh data sharing and storytelling of, of um, food sourcing, but now we're seeing a lot of a lot more excitement in uh, engineering around things like blockchain, right? And so I would love to discuss more about blockchain, but I think, you know, over the next five years, we're finally going to have a time where uh, we're marrying nanotechnology, biotechnology with companies like Appeal Sciences mm -hmm. with applications coming out from a Department of Homeland Security where we're adding markers that don't really affect the flavor or the taste or the shape of our produce uh, with information that can tell us exactly where that item was grown, is coming from all the checkpoints and nodes throughout the process all the way to our tables. And so we're finally at a time where we're marrying uh, the science and the interest and the consumer demand with um, making sure that we have the right data and cloud infrastructure. Yeah. Well, you mentioned blockchain. We were talking about it backstage. Um, how does that play? For, for someone who doesn't understand blockchain w very well, what it, does anyone want to take a stab at defining it and what it means for the food and agriculture space? Alon, I think you have. <laughs> yeah. uh, so maybe I'll take a bit. Not necessarily the skeptic point of view, but more sort of the, um, I think, what needs to happen to be convinced sure. uh, component. Um, so I think the first thing is, at least coming from the agriculture world, buzzwords don't sell really the product, don't sell adoption. People have to see a value for it uh, in itself, and it has to bring value to them. Um, what's in it for me, right? Um, I think it's great to imagine people want end-to-end -end traceability on everything, but if it's more work for no upside, um, there's not going to be much adoption associated with that. Um, and that can be sort of technology agnostic at the end of the day. When I think of blockchain, at least from my understanding, blockchain I think tends to work very well in a digital pure world, um, but agriculture remains something that's very physical, whether you like it or not. You know, um, a bushel of corn is a physical thing. Uh, a bushel of wheat is a physical thing. And so, uh, you know, I'm curious to see, can we develop markers such that it, you can truly unify sort of this physical world to this digital world, but or else that physical thing and the information about it is only going to be as good as the person putting it into a digital form or the system putting it into a digital form before it can flow digitally. <laughs> so that's the part where I'm, I'm still struggling to kind of tie a very physical world to, to a digital world. And I come from sort of a bulk world in fruit and vegetable, higher value add. I can see where there's more pull and willingness to put into that effort. But in sort of a bulk commodity world, it's, it's a tougher sell. I agree with that. I think in the bulk commodity world, like selling a bushel of wheat or something, is, it's going to take a, 
quite a while to get some traceability markers on that. But you have seen some venture funding come through even this year, local uh, venture firm and S2G Ventures mm -hmm. funded um, around for 6.2 million for uh, nanotechnology spray that has an RFD marker where you can track an apple from the farm all the way to the grocery store to the table. Um, and so with blockchain and some of the other technologies that's coming out, now with something that could be applied, I mentioned Appeal earlier. Appeal is gonna be launching this spring. Um, they protect, they can keep an avocado, and this might sound crazy, so there's still kind of focus groups happening, but they can give spray an avocado, it lasts three times longer. Um, flowers, many of our berries that we see rotting in our refrigerators because uh, consumers are a large part of the waste in um, the supply chain right now. But uh, the technology is there and it's being funded and I think uh, consumers just don't quite understand what that means because mm -hmm. we have to solve for issues like uh, the GMO complex, mm -hmm. right? Like how do you introduce something that has some negatives and some positives, but if you don't, tell it right to the consumers, then it can have tremendous effect on the industry. And so I think once the storytelling and the marketing around some of the new technologies that are coming out um, solve for what happened with things like GMO, I think, I think we'll see a lot of change. Yeah, I just want to add uh, two points. One is kind of building on something that's been highlighted here, which is it really takes a broad skill set when we talk about, you know, how to bring these businesses. And, and I highlighted a lot around our engineering. You know, we have nutritionists on staff, microbiologists. Uh, but my background is in sales and marketing. I come from the consumer packaged goods world as well as I've headed the marketing for supermarket chains and specialty gourmet retailers. And so the point with that is that you really need to understand, again, the strategy about where you're selling, what you're selling and thinking about what is that market and the, the stories and how do you tell the stories and what's important. But it has to start with the consumer insight in terms of the business proposition and what are you trying to address. And so what we're trying to work on and, and what we're doing is really instead of the old adage of like, you know, I grow it and I hope I sell it, you know, everything that we grow is sold. And the idea is that, again, this is just in time growing, working with our selling partners. So it's really flipping the whole equation. And that's allowing us to have a very different uh, impact in the market. But it takes a broad skill set from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, at Aero Farms, just to highlight a couple of things we are doing today already, uh, the markers are a really exciting area, and we think the biome is also a really exciting area in terms of future developments. Uh, but with our ability to have controlled growing from seed to package all under one roof, and with the sensors and the monitors, we're actually able to trace down to the square inch what's happening with that seed and what are the inputs that are going into that. And so that's allowing us to have a new level of visibility and transparency and tra traceability that out in the field you can just never have that level of control. So it's giving us insights not only from a food safety standpoint, but we also highlight, again, understanding the levers in terms of like how do we stress the plants in different ways so that we can get different reactions. So we can make something more spicy, we can get increase the, the nutrient density of something, we can change the color. I mean, these are all things that we can do to help stress the plant in different ways and understanding that interaction. So it's an exciting area right now. If I would add that at least in sort of broad acre agriculture, the information is more and more there. Uh, we have precision ag where we capture a lot of information both in terms of, you know, not only yield in a field but more and more what we're actually prescribing on the field. Uh, what seed density are we applying? Uh, we're down to the point where we can actually flip between hybrids as we're sowing. Uh, we can switch from a more performing hybrid in the higher performing part of the field to a less performing corn hybrid in the less performing part of the field. And we can adjust the rate of fertilizer we apply when we go in later and so forth. So if we really wanted, we actually have the information as to exactly what we did in that field. And as a result, how is this particular tonnage of grain that came off that field produced? Uh, it's just there's only limited examples to date of people really wanting that information. It's coming. Um, there is more and more, particularly in the livestock industry, an interest in tying back, if you're raising a chicken or a hog or whatnot, the actual grain that was used to feed those animals, how is it produced? Because if you're trying to build either visibility on the supply chain or the sustainability of that production, you're going to need those different pieces of information. Um, it's just fairly complex. There's a lot of moving parts. and there's only limited aggressive pull for it. I think it will come. I just don't know exactly in what form and ultimately how that information will move up and down and whether or not there'll be truly end value for it that'll make its way back up to the producer because that's what's going to drive whether or not people are willing to do this. Yeah, I mean, that 
end value that you're talking about is whether or not you can act in time, so you have the data, but then how do you make it actionable and then see an impact? And again, this is the challenge with the field is this, again, you only have one May every year, so again, isolating the variables and then being able to optimize in that environment. It's gonna be a, a, a process that will iterate over time, but it will take some time. Yeah, but, uh, I'm sorry, we, I think we know, you know, like what can be actionable right now in terms, in terms of food safety. You know, like how can we eliminate any major breakouts mm -hmm. before they even happen, right? And so food safety would be a very interesting driver. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, just the trend in, in kind of uh, visibility and transparency through every industry um, and how that spurs uh, consumer consumer growth and, and, and consumer spend, uh, that'll be kind of secondary and see where that goes. Hmm. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, you mentioned GMOs earlier. Obviously GMOs created a, they, they're an ongoing point of conversation with the consumer base and um, I think there's a lot of interest in seeing how consumers react to CRISPR-Cas9 or gene editing. There's a lot of interest in seeing what's going to happen with sort of new proteins or uh, alternative proteins that are being put out on the market. I'm curious. Um, especially from a marketing perspective, Mark, but any of these conversations, what are, what are companies thinking about? What should they be thinking about in terms of how they talk to the consumer about the science? Yeah, it's a great um, observation, I think, with CRISPR. This line is going to get really blurred very, very soon as well, so it's going to be more challenging. Uh, but I think, again, the consumer has demonstrated, so companies have responded. I mean, why have the consumer packaged goods companies now voluntarily started to label? Because they're looking at the consumers at the end of the day. So regulation and government was able to do it, but the consumer was able to, to really drive that. Um, this is one of the areas that is, is kind of challenging, just in terms of education, right? So what's needed is just really understanding and appreciating. You know, when you say GMO, it's very complex. Uh, for the category, and we can grow a wide range of different uh, types of categories of food, but our systems today are optimized around short stem leafy greens and herbs. It's an area where there are no GMO um, offerings. And so, you know, we actually still put on the package non-GMO. It's a spurious claim. I hate it. But it's one of the things we talk about, about how do we give the consumer reassurance for something that you know, they have this uh, you know, perception around. Uh, it's the same thing that we have the same challenge. You know, this is really loaded, but organic is the same way in the sense of what does organic mean? There's a perception of no pesticides, but that's not the case at all. And so labels are, are providing reassurance, but there's still, even with things that have been out there for, for decades now, um, a lot of confusion. So education is going to be one of those big challenges we have as an industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would tend to agree on the education piece. Um, I'm not yet convinced it's yet a one argument, far from it. Um, I think, you know, if you take a bit back the history of GMO, the initial wave of technology was very much about providing value to the producer. It was never talking to the end consumer. You know, I come from a farming background. We grow GMO corn and soybean. Um, it's extremely efficient. It's simplified the way we produce a lot. So it speaks to the value proposition to us. But then um, if I go into a downtown city and I you know, start walking around with GMO soybeans, one person out of two is almost offended by that. Um, and and it's, it's really this notion of, from my point of view of the world, it adds a lot of value. Now you shift the GMO debate and you actually say, well, what if we created genetically modified plants that have a direct value to the end consumer? Um, there's been attempts. Uh, in Canada, we had a huge controversy. And, you know, we do GMO in plants. We're starting to do GMO in animals. Uh, a company tried to market GMO salmon, and it's been a big controversy in the U.S. as well. Huge backlash. Um, it's way, been accepted, though. It proof. was accepted from a regulatory point yeah. of view, but the consumer has completely uh, rejected yeah. it. It was the same phenomenon in the U.S. The FDA pre-approved it. Congress went against it. Now it's kind of coming back. But there's that clash of the scientists, the regulatory view, um, takes a bit of a purist point of view, forgetting about what the consumer at the end of the day is going to be willing to pay for. Um, and so, you know, the Arctic apple that doesn't brown, like same thing. We've tried Simplot potatoes. McDonald's said no to them. Um, so there's a bunch of things that even though we start saying this is good, this is better, there hasn't been the uptick. And so I'm not yet convinced it's going to work to be proven wrong on the education piece, but maybe we'll have a complete different paradigm shift. The aero farms are going to say, you know what, we can produce lots of it. It doesn't have to be GMO, and this may start moving into row crops or things like that. Totally.
take on a, another marketing beast, right? It needs right. to have a different name <laughs> and a different application. <clears throat> Yeah, no, I mean, our Apple is a great one because you talk to any consumer and you say, you know, would you like to ha not have your Apple brown? They all say yes, you know. And would you like to have that convenience of a slice and you're having it giving out to your family member? And they're all, yes, of course. And then um, it, it's really an interesting case study in terms of, again, how to bring that to market and seeing what the reception is. Um, I, I think that's going to be one of the winning ones, though, out of the things that we're seeing because of um, the convenience and, and, the, and the value proposition there. So those are things that will help, I think, certain things with adoption. Yeah. So another another point of discussion that people are quite interested in is what does it mean for Amazon to be entering the food space? So thinking about traceability of the consumer and the traceability they have to a lot of suppliers, the position they're going to be occupying. I've had a lot of people ask me to speculate. I feel not uh, equipped to do so, but I'm going to see if any of you want to take a stab at speculating on what it means for Amazon or for some <laughs> companies getting into this. I mean, I don't necessarily want to talk about it when it comes to like traceability, yeah. because Amazon hasn't even figured that out for its books. Like, you can't, <laughs> you, I can't tell you where the book came from, exactly yeah. where the paper came from. Um, so that's going to be a while for Amazon. But I do think it has a ton of implication for, you know, smaller CPG companies um, and for, for brick and mortar. Like, you're going to have lots of opportunities to grow a national brand selling cookies or fruit snacks or, you know, companies like Soylent, even beverage companies, mm -hmm. you can scale like you never could before. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're going to have to figure out how to reinvent brick and mortar because um, I, I know what I did Friday morning and I just, like, opened my phone <laughs> and ordered from some small businesses and then from Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so there's going to be a lot more implications on, like, restaurants and um, grocers locally and, and we'll kind of see how they're going to weather that and it's going to take a lot of partnerships and a lot of innovation on that side to kind of tame what where Amazon can go with shifting the market. Mm -hmm. I mean it's part of a bigger commentary in retail overall right in terms of consolidation so there's much fewer number of major players, uh, grocery shopping in particular, gone from very much local, regional, now you have these national chains. So just in general, you know, you have less negotiating power as the vendor or the supplier. Uh, but ultimately what this is, is going to help the whole industry in terms of supply chain efficiency. And I think those benefits, you know, again, will be able to uh, be reinvested back into the industry and there'll be benefits from that standpoint. The thing is, you know, again, Amazon, you know, they disclose some of their areas that they're serving, right? So, again, the idea of how do you really bridge this last uh, part of the equation in terms of, particularly when it's a fresh, perishable product, um, it, there's still a lot of trial uh, and, and error that's going to be out there. Great. Well, pretty soon we're going to switch to questions. I'm starting to get quite a few on the, on the um, uh, online portal, but we'll also take some from the audience. But before we do that, uh, we're going to be focusing this year at the Chicago Council for our Global Food Security Report on youth um, and youth livelihoods in rural areas, specifically looking at, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is going to have this massive increase in population, very young population already, and getting younger. South Asia has a very young population, many of them still rural and relying on agriculture and food, and, and certainly that's true in other regions as well. Um, and a lot of what we're talking about is preparation of young people to be employed in the food and agriculture sector in those regions. But I think it's a conversation here as well, and I'm curious. Um, we've also got some students sitting in the audience. What kinds of um, what kinds of, of of education shifts do we need to make to prepare the workforce for success, both here in the U.S. or in, in sort of wealthier economies, and also what what should we be preparing for in terms of the future of work in agriculture and food globally? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can share some examples of what we've been doing. So, for example, in Newark. Uh, this is by way of background. Our, our company started out in Ithaca, upstate New York, in the Finger Lakes area. Uh, our chief science officer was a professor at Cornell, so one of the top ag schools. Uh, we moved our headquarters down to Newark, New Jersey about three years ago to be able to serve the New York metro market area. Uh, part of it was our ability to recruit and, uh, and attract talent, but part of it was that we've had a working farm in an inner city school for over seven years. And so we see this is a kindergarten through eighth grade program, and we have a working farm right in their dining hall. And they call it a dining hall specifically because all of a sudden it's now become another classroom you know, for the students. And so they see firsthand how their food has grown. Uh, it's the shortest farm to table experience around for the students. So you create that connection. Uh, is really one of the most important lessons, particularly when we talk about urbanization and thinking about, again, that connection with your food and where it comes from. 
And all of a sudden, it's not a funny food. It's something that they've grown. There's a tremendous amount of engagement. And so they're eating it, so you're able to have an impact on behavior. And then that fosters the curiosity about like what are the inputs, again, in terms of that science. So we talk about that STEM focus. Again, those are some of the, the, the skills. Uh, we have sixth graders that are write, you know, writing you know, Raspberry Pi programming to be able to do, you know, again, um, remote remonitoring of you know, when they're on school vacation. So it's, like, it's remarkable in terms of like, how can you foster that, how do you encourage that and see it firsthand, the impact it can have. Yeah, I think in the U.S. we're going to have more impact on like, um, health when it comes to food and understanding mm -hmm. and growing. Um, schools are going to be a great example of that. You ha I have um, work work closely with Ron Finley out of LA where he's always like plant some shit, kind of gorilla uh, gardener down in uh, South Central, like, you know, teaching right there. Like once you see how a strawberry grows, you're gonna appreciate that, right? And so I really see uh, food education in schools being a big part of how we solve a lot of our chronic disease issues here in the US. Mm -hmm. um, Abroad, it's going to be very interesting to see how agriculture and agriculture technology grows, how does storage grow, how do we um, apply some of the efficiencies to these different communities. Um, knowledge is much easier to access now, but we need to solve for things like waste and cold supply chain is very hard to figure out if we don't have, um, if we're not building and manufacturing here on these continents. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot more opportunity for youth to grow their business and their skill sets, I think, abroad. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I, mean, I think the only thing I would add is um, maybe to even revisit a bit the model of education that we use, particularly, and I'm by no means an expert in, 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 uh, in sort of developing economy or African continent um, sort of agriculture, but at least the understanding I get is because of the penetration of digital coming in fairly faster, there's an opportunity to uh, rethink as opposed to, okay, you want to build an agriculture program, um, let's go build an ag school and move a bunch of professors or teach a bunch of professors. And I'm kind of looking at the paradigm. My father's an agronomist who spent a lot of time in the early 90s, I'd see him leave and kind of establish an ag program in Mali and, 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 and Madagascar and whatnot, and that was the model. But now that you have this digital component, maybe you don't need to do all that. You kind of more drive the education piece um, through access simply online of like, here's your basic agronomy. This is what you need to know. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, a couple weeks ago, it was Agrotechnica, which is sort of the big uh, global Ag Equipment Fair in Germany, and Bio Crop Science was coming out with basically an app where you take a picture of any pest, a plant, um, an insect, uh, you know, shading on the leaf that indicates a particular fungi, and they can tell you right away what it is and kind of the prescription of what it is in terms of how to tackle this. So just translate that to an environment where you're teaching basic agronomy. Well, there's many different ways to teach that basic agronomy. I feel like you set me up because the council has a paper coming out in the next week on, on digital agricultural extension, exploring okay. exactly this point, which is that people are accessing information completely differently, including about how to grow, how to sell. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is I joined a private Facebook group uh, of Kenyan farmers that was 70,000 farmers in April. It's now 120,000 farmers. And they're sharing information about production, where to sell, where to buy. It's a, it's a completely open channel to get that information, which wouldn't have been happening a couple years ago, a year ago, <laughs> in that way. Um, so I want to shift to question and answer. We've got quite a bit uh, here online, but I'm going to see first if anybody in the room wants to begin, and then I'll take a look at their questions. Marshall, I'm trying to. I'd like to. Microphone's ask... coming. One second. No, sorry. No, no. I'd like to ask you all to come back to the question of the consumer. Um, first, I gather none of your businesses uh, has really, you are a producer facing, trader dealer facing business. You are a uh, wholesaler facing business. You're not f selling directly to the consumer. I don't uh, know if. We, we do. So. You do? Yeah. But locally, yeah, I presume, in Newark. Directly, yeah. Sorry. In New York Metro, but yeah. So I want to ask how do you establish the value proposition for the consumer? Um, and what do you see as the resistance? We, I've been in discussion just a week ago with 
George Church, one of the leading biologists in the world today, about the CRISPR issue and public education around genetic technologies in particular, in which his answer was, I have not a clue how we're going to deal with this. <laughs> Another example was that somebody said, uh, well, he saw uh, uh, salt pa packages of salt being advertised as non-GMO because it's a marketing <laughs> gimmick, right? So that's become a gimmick. It was supposed to be consumer-facing uh, uh, proposition was turned out to be turns out to be in in considerable measure a marketing gimmick. So. I'd like to hear you talk more about the ultimate, the end user here. I don't hear any examples of, you know, a kind of vertically integrated app that is going to go, that is going to really help consumers make these choices. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we built with Food Trace. We, we were B2B2C, right? We gave, the we gave the businesses the tool to share exactly where their products were coming from on social media and gathered a lot of data from that. I built that because in my first business in, in 2012, um, we were a very fast growing juice bar earlier in the year. We had a health blogger come in our third month in operation. We grew to over a million in sales that year. But she came and she, and this is when like blogging and Twitter is really taking off. And it's, I don't know, February. And she orders a blueberry smoothie. Um, and we had a delivery come in, and we marketed ourselves as organic. We were mostly organic, uh, but in Chicago, you cannot always buy organic blueberries, right? At least you can't from Michigan. And she saw that order of blueberries come in, fresh, nice, great tasting blueberries, and it did not say organic on that box. And she like lit us up all over Twitter, in social media, and, and on her blog. And her blog showed up on the first page of Google when you searched our business. And I was horrified from there and built a tool um, and tried to understand the consumer as much as possible. And I think that's what all businesses have to do today. And with, with the next round of GMO companies or labels or solutions that come out, we need to engage with the consumers before we even market to the, the grocery stores and the e-tellers that sell them the products. If we do not engage with consumers at every level in every city and you know every, every background, then we're going to always miss the mark. And, and that's how I look at it, and that's how I approach um, whether I'm consulting or helping a business grow or how I build my companies. Yeah, I, I talked a little bit about my background in consumer packaged goods with brand management. It starts with the consumer, right? And so. What we did is we, we did primary research. We did major customer segmentation studies, understanding key drivers, what are the key attributes. And so we totally flipped it again, understanding what were the needs and what were the pain points. And so the number one trend at retail is local. And so we tap into that. So this idea that we can bring the farm to the community and to um, and have it be by the community, for the community, is one of the things that the, they're, they're, they're uh, voting with their wallet on every day. Then we talked about in terms of key benefits, so the idea that we were able to grow with no pesticides, uh, the idea that we were able to grow with 95% less water, this environmental story as well has, has really resonated. Uh, and then we talk about a different story, though, to our selling partners. Uh, so we sell to a wide range. So we sell to retailers, all the mass supermarkets. We sell to food, and, uh, food service. We sell to institutions and schools. But we talk about what are their pain points. So it's around sourcing. It's around availability. It's around consistency. Uh, it's around being able to offer something on a year-round basis. And so that's changing what some of the things that they're facing with in terms of what they're having uh, as their pain points. And so we think about the different messages for those different audiences. But at the end of the day, the consumer, that end consumer, is so critical to them, uh, this whole value proposition. Great. Um, I'm going to take a question here from, from the online uh, community. We have question says, what, what do you anticipate will be the greatest surprises in the field in the next decade? And I don't know if they mean in the field or in the field, but you can interpret that question. What's going to surprise people? So I'll take a crack. I think okay. one of the things that I think could be really interesting is a huge paradigm shift as to how we do broad acre agriculture. Uh, robotics are coming into the field. Uh, you know, we're starting to see these swarm robot concepts. Instead, instead of taking one very big machine, we're breaking it down into many small machines. And if you kind of look at the history of agriculture, you know, it was man, then it was animal, then we discovered chemicals, and then we made the machines even bigger, and we structured the environments in which we produce food uh, because of that, and we're kind of stuck on that structure and approach. <clears throat> 
If you say, well, throw a bunch of mini robots that are very self-autonomous and can run around and zip around in the field and whatnot, we don't need super aligned straight rows. Uh, we don't need to only be able to go into the field at very specific periods in the year before the plants get too big and that we start driving over them and so forth. And so, you know, maybe it's way out thinking, but it, it opens up the mind to think about a very different approach of doing things if you kind of think on 20, 30 year arches of how technologies can completely change what we think is the unchangeable way of doing things today. Um, so I think that that's one theme. I think the other theme that I sometimes like to, to kind of push a bit the thinking is, if you have a clear mandate on the end side, you can push a shift. Um, and <clears throat> again, you know, looking a bit agrotechnical, looking at equipment manufacturers, Europe has a fairly aggressive drive in certain countries for organic production. There's a good share of the demand that's there. And you see innovation happen, even in broad scale agriculture of a whole bunch of funky looking what I call implements, pieces of metal that scratch the dirt, flip the dirt, bury the weeds, whatever it is. We don't have some of those here, but there's more of those and the innovation is really picking up. And so we assume, okay, to accomplish this form of agriculture, we need the chemicals and the heavy mechanical work. Maybe there's kind of another way. It's a question of thinking long and hard about how to do it. Um, you know, robots can be an enabler of that. Robots are kind of a mechanical replacement of a chemical weeding approach. So I think thinking about these things and could they help each other or drive sort of new models of production at scale is something that I like to think about could be a big surprise five, ten years out from now. Yeah, you know, I really think that in, in ten years makes it a lot easier, the question more than five years. Um, if, when I learned, um, I, I can't remember if this was undergrad or grad school, but when I learned that you know, over 40% of the US, in the US we waste over 40% of everything that's grown uh, across the world. Um, we grow enough in the US probably, and maybe with one other country, in US and Mexico can, um, everything that we grow in US and Mexico can feed all of those malnourished, undernourished. Uh, so I really think that uh, across the world, we're going to see a tremendous impact in solving for um, malnutrition and world hunger. Mm -hmm. um, we've come to a time where like, it's exciting to eat a cricket cookie, right? Or we can grow our burgers. And this is all happening in the next couple of years. As we go back to our roots, we're going to have tremendous, uh, tremendous innovation and uh, kind of the, the corner of taste and sustainability mm -hmm. and, and health, right? And so before, it was not exciting eating a, a, a vegan burger for most people. And you could trick a lot of people today with the vegan burger, mm -hmm. um, with th things that are entering the market. Not only that, there are people that just enjoy a broader range of flavors. And, and then when you figure out that there are companies that are now being funded, there are companies that are in the pipeline that are gonna solve for cold supply chain issues, for, uh, you know, for major storage issues that exist on other continents, as well as um, just pest control in a very natural alternative way. I think we're gonna find that our food is available more than we, than we previously saw it. And we have to work out some trade issues and, and, and some other things, but I, I think we're gonna have um, kind of commercialized, packaged uh, solutions for in 10 years, what we're going to have eight, 8 billion people. So it's, it's actually, uh, there's a lot to look forward to if, if we apply the right kind of solutions and focus. Yeah, I think the lens is, you know, certainly how we look at it is, you know, how do we eliminate elements here, like the waste? Um, so the circular economy, this is something that is part of our company, it's part of our DNA in terms of how we think about uh, each part of the equation, so whether it's the water, whether it's uh, the fact that we don't use pesticides. Um, we think those are key elements in terms of, again, re reinterpreting this idea of 40% waste uh, of the people are throwing out. Of the, uh, if you take it all the way back to the value chain, what this complex supply chain, you take it back to the farm, it's actually 76% for leafy greens. So think about all that embedded energy. Um, and you think about, again, uh, again, not having that food actually going to people. So there's opportunities. And that's 
this idea of the swarm, we're kind of thinking like the swarm farm, right, if you will, the idea of you can have distributed food production and that all of a sudden doesn't have to be centralized. And this is one of the ways, again, how you can enable that to have the right kind of efficiency. Um, just to highlight, I mean, this is a way of growing with what we're doing with vertical farming. Uh, with a faster crop cycle, the idea that we're not competing with weeds, and so there's yeah. much more density per square foot. It's a way of growing that's 390 times more productive on an annualized basis versus the field farm. And people look at that like, how do I interpret that? What does that mean? And the reality is, is that, you know, again, it's not even factoring in the fact that if there's a, a weather issue or climate issue, I mean, all those are becoming more acute as well. Um, but more importantly, how we can use this way of growing to have a more nutri nutritionally dense product as well. So we see opportunities that have a very different product proposition and value proposition. You know. and so things that we're working on today, you know, we think we'll, you know, we'll see a lot of truly the fruits of that you know, within the 10 years. Okay, let's take a couple more questions over here and then there. We'll take two before we turn back. Um, the congratulations on your innovations. I'm really inspired by your stories. I'm interested in your relationship with big agribusiness, you know, companies like the Cargills, the ADMs, Doles, Monsantos. Are they a partner, investor, a competitor, a threat, or a friend? I mean, tell us how that influences your business model. And take one more before we turn it on. Nathan Carson, University of Chicago. Um, you mentioned earlier that we're going to have to be doubling our agricultural output in order to feed the world's growing population. Um, but there's a problem in that because we, we're lacking the human capacity, although the demand is there for agricultural production. Um, so my question is about human capacity building, building human capital. Because um, it's estimated, like you said, about the average age in the U.S. for growers is about 57. It's projected that about 40% of USDA is going to be retiring over the next decade. I'm an alma mater at Purdue University, and the Agricultural Economics Department, we had about seven faculty retire last year. And so there's this huge brain drain that's happening in agriculture. And so my question is, how do you plan as leaders in agriculture, uh, in consumer food products, food services, how do you plan on partnering with these premier land-grant institutions like your University of Florida's, your Purdue's, your Cornell's to develop the next generation in this human capacity? Uh, I'll highlight again a couple things that we're doing in terms of, again, how we think about public and private partnerships. And part of it's working with government agencies. So, for example, we're the recipient of a million dollar grant from the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research that also is also partnering then with some of the land grant universities. So we're working with uh, Rutgers as well as Cornell. So the idea is how do we extend these lessons and be able to apply it then to a broader industry so that the lessons, uh, so we'll publish something within a three year time period. But these are opportunities we think can help you know, foster uh, both in terms of inspiration but also in terms of driving you know, what's needed in terms of that next curriculum. Uh, this is a program though specifically around our ability to identify stressors of leafy greens around again nutrition and, and flavor. And flavor is one of these things, you know, that is really um, you know, not as easily quantifiable. So we're doing things specifically with the food science program at Rutgers around um, sensory and sensory evaluation and looking at satiety and thinking about how those are all inter interwoven together. Um, but this is an opportunity where we're partnering specifically with, with the universities to be able to help, you know, be able to help them, you know, kind of advance what they're doing. So those are some of the things that we're doing to help, you know, from that standpoint. I think um, when you think about Monsanto and Cargill, they understand that um, innovation can happen very fast. Uh, startups can make a, a very big dent very fast, and, and marketing communication um, can lead to a lot of problems for them. So Monsanto has a venture company or a venture arm in St. Louis. Cargill is par partnered with Rabobank and Food Tech Connect to work on actively investing in these spaces that don't necessarily align with what people think their uh, business model or their traditional um, focus has been in. Uh, so I, I have remember being requested, um, or I remember engaging with Monsanto Venture Partners very early on in our process um, in, in 2014, and started to learn more about their portfolios, Tyson Ventures. A lot of these companies are creating venture arms so that they're not left out in the innovation. Um, and then I think, I don't know if you want to answer the question, but I was Sure, yeah, go. <laughs> I know. I was going to talk about the human capacity. Go ahead. Sure. Um, go ahead, and we'll come back to you on the competitor question. Oh, you know, I really think that um, 
we're just going to solve that with robots and uh, efficiency software. <laughs> like that's 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 how I think we're going to solve a lot of this demand. Unfortunately, and fortunately, we're just going to build more robots, and that time is coming. So well, I'm going to. I'm going to yeah. link back to you. Made a question about about robots. Are we going to have people on the field in the future? Um, I mean, I think it'll take time to shift, but I think you will see less. We already have less and less people on the fields. Like, you drive large piece of equipment today. It practically self drives. It turns on its own. You're just there, kind of hanging out, making sure nothing goes wrong. Now. We haven't gotten to the point, you, you can read about this, I mean, John Deere will admit, like, I can't get, they can't get to a fully autonomous, there's just this human element that's still there that is, can feel something's not right or whatnot, but, you know, there's less and less of a need. Um, <clears throat> great video on YouTube if you want to watch Farm Future, it's this 2030 concept, farmer getting up, just playing with his iPad, and the drones are out there doing their thing. Um, but, yeah, I do think you will have less and less people in the field. And do you want to take a competitor question? Yeah, sure. So uh, Monsanto Growth Ventures is actually one of our investors, among others. Um, and I think what they're thinking exactly to uh, what was being said is the notion that they're looking outside to kind of see what are the paradigm shifts that are going to potentially chew up their business. You know, uh, it's kind of a cliche, but the concept of data is eating the world or software is eating the world applies in the agriculture space. Um, iron, tractors, like, the physical thing and chemicals are becoming commodities. What matters is either the super advanced know-how on biotech and whatnot, which is enabled by data and information, or to take all this information that we have from all these sensors on the field. Everyone talks about IoT, Internet of Things. <clears throat> I don't think there's a greater space for Internet of Things than agriculture. You've got to crunch the data and make sense of it, and the value is there. So. These companies realize, whoops, like I got to shift or else I'm just going to become a commodity producer. There's a business model that works on being a commodity producer. But what you can't be is both. You can't try to be a premium innovation company and try to be a commodity producer at the same time. It's a business model that doesn't work. So it's kind of a natural hedge to what's going to potentially chew out their traditional businesses. You know, to MG MGV's portfolio is brought. It's not just about Monsanto, far from it. It's actually, what's the future of food and agriculture? Where do we, where do we kind of take bets? If we look at you know, the Cargills, the ADMs of the world, you know, from our point of view, in, in there are situations where they are, they are clients of ours because they buy grain and export grain. Um, but they're also seeing the writing on the wall, and they're moving away from sort of businesses that thrive on information because they realize that that information is becoming available to the producer or the end user, playing the middleman role purely on information is, is getting a little bit more difficult year by year. Um, so what they're doing is they're either moving into higher value add or specialty products. Cargill is shifting a lot of its in business into fisheries, into like um, um, aquaculture. They're moving into um, sort of more data enabled agriculture, decision making, animal nutrition based on information. Um, but at the end of the day, they still play a critical role, at least if you look at a global level, they provide critical infrastructure points. Because at the end of the day, do not forget, agriculture is a physical thing. You don't move 10,000 or 20,000 tons of grain just like that. It's got to get out of the prairies, get on a rail, get loaded on a boat, go to a terminal facility somewhere in China, got to get put back on physical vehicles and move where it needs to be. And if we forget that part, uh, we're kidding ourselves about you know, the physical aspect of agriculture. Well, we've gotten to the end of our uh, formal program here. There's going to be networking afterwards. And thankfully, it's a small enough room. I think most people can come find our speakers and, and maybe ask some questions. But I'll just flag some of the, the questions that were on the, on the table that we didn't get to. And hopefully, they can continue afterwards. We had questions about food waste and the responsibility of restaurants in the food waste uh, area, and especially chefs. Uh, questions about uh, climate smart agriculture, how to attract young people uh, into careers in agriculture, um, and there was a question specifically related to the nanotechnology sprays and concerns about what those mean for health. So um, lots of active questions going on. Hopefully we, could, we can keep talking afterwards, but I just want to thank all three of you for joining, and uh, thank you all for coming. We're looking forward to talking. Cool.